Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another wonderful episode of Play Pause Rewind, a podcast Ooh. where we talk about movies and sometimes TV shows. Niles, mm-hmm. how have you been the last two weeks since our last episode? I've been busy running around like a chicken with my head cut off, I feel like these Whoa! Days. Just got a lot of stuff to do. I don't know. I've just, just been going along to a lot of events, went to a concert this last weekend, mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun. Went and saw Flogging Molly. Um, oh, so if fun. Any of you guys that sounds... <laughs> know who he... Yeah, it was fucking cool. They're an Irish band, <laughs> and they are just, yeah, pretty... They're kind of punk, but not exactly. The openers were definitely punk, but cool. these guys... It was like, yeah, you can get a Bosch bit going, and I'm just going to stand in the back and just say, yeah, have fun down there. <laughs> how, how have you been, Dylan? Uh, doing all right. I had some tough personal stuff going on the last couple weeks, but uh, otherwise doing okay watched a ton of stuff in the last few weeks Mm -hmm. and uh excited to talk about our main topic of this episode which is the recently concluded last or first season of the last of us (laughs) on hbo uh it's their newest prestige drama series i suppose and is an adaptation of the video game the same name uh released 10 years ago by naughty dog studios uh, created by Neil Druckmann and Craig Mazin. The series stars Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey, and it centers around a man, Joel, who is tasked with bringing a young girl across post-apocalyptic America to a group of freedom fighters known as the Fireflies. Um, and as the two journey across the country, their bond grows, and they come across a variety of different characters all dealing with their own shit. Uh, <laughs> so, Niles, um, non-spoiler thoughts first, of course, as always. Uh, what did you think about The Last of Us? Oh, still, <laughs> what a devastatingly romantic series. I was enthralled by it. Mm-hmm. I honestly, yeah, because I didn't play the game. I, I've always wanted to. I've always wanted yeah. to play both the games. I just have not. I didn't have a. I didn't have the PS3 when it came out, so I couldn't play it. Unfortunately, um, I know I could definitely play it now. I, I'm mm-hmm. going to get around to it. But I mean, I just yeah. know that these games have just been so like, like impactful in the video mm-hmm. game community. And just people have just loved these games. And then the second one, like there was like so much controversy in the fan base because of like some I think just like some decisions in the narrative, you know, like, yeah, just, like, and fans uh, were kind of split on that stuff. So it's and, just, like, and it's, that's an important note in in our spoiler section. We are not going to do any spoilers for things yes. that happened in Last of Us Part Two. This is only the events of the first season, which is the first game. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have played the games and are in our comment section, <laughs> don't be a fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah, right. Like just um, just leave it alone. But yeah. yeah, I loved it. What about what about you? What are your initial thoughts, Stone? Yes, uh, I am with you pretty much on all fronts, and uh, you you made a good note. We should establish our relationship with the games. I also have never had a PlayStation, so I have not had the opportunity to play them. Uh, part one is now on PC, so it's on my list to get and play, but I've been very familiar with this game's story anyway, just because being in like the gaming space when the, when it came out, it was it was something you just picked up on, and I... At the time, I was like, well, I, I'm not I don't have a PlayStation. I won't get to play it. So I just right. like watched videos and read about it, which is a terrible way to experience a story. <laughs> but even even with that, I was like, this is something really special. Uh, and what I love about video game adaptations getting good is that finally friends and family who don't play games can experience these stories. And yeah. uh my family members watched this show as well and really enjoyed it also. So that was really special to uh, see. But on that note, like I think this show works marvelously both on its own and as an adaptation of the video game. And mm-hmm. uh, it, and more so than most video game adaptations, really understood yeah. how to translate the story from game to television. Uh, the creator's kind of oh you have a note that's your note i was just reading it. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean i was just kind of picking back off of what you just said like the creators were very intentional mm-hmm. in what they pulled from the source material and what they decided not to and they walked a very fine balance i think and i'm again i'm not 100 percent familiar with every mm-hmm. beat of the first game and everything like that but it felt like you know i know that there's certain scenes and stuff that they 
pulled directly from the video yes. game, like the giraffe sequence and like walking across that, like the bridges and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like some of those shots clearly pulled from the video game. Yeah. And like, I think there's like some moments, like I watched this with my girlfriend where I was like, Oh yeah. Is this one of those points from the video game? She would ask me, I'm like, I don't know. I didn't play it, but it definitely feels <laughs> like it, you know? Yeah. And I think that was more like the action scenes and everything like that. But the creators, I think they, 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 knew the right way to blend in new narrative elements Mm -hmm. and these new ideas without overpowering the original creativity that was there. Right. Uh, I I found the note I was trying to read too. I put in spoilers (laughs) for some reason. Um, Yeah. But I think this along with uh, the couple or handful of other good video game adaptations uh, really works because the people making it understand and respect the original work uh, for for far too long in video game adaptations, I think they were being written and made by people who either didn't understand video games, had never touched the original piece of media they were adapting, or just viewed games as a lesser art form, if art at all, which I think is yeah. really weird and stupid. But like, just imagine if someone was adapting a book and they were proudly flaunting that they'd never read it. That was what <laughs> fans of video games were dealing with for a long time when we would get video wow. game adaptations, it's like, that's just really disrespectful. <laughs> and oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think having Druckmann as a lead creator, uh, who was the game director of the last of us games, oh. obviously played a big role in that change, but uh, we've talked about it before, but part of making a good adaptation is understanding what works in one media versus another. And so there were scenes that are word for word from the game, but there are other scenes that we'll talk about in spoilers that were uh, not in the game at all or things mm-hmm. that changed from the game. And I think what Druckmann said in one of the inside the episodes, is like if uh, what we had originally in the game is better then we keep that. But if we come up with something new and that's better, we go with that. And I think that's a really healthy attitude to take when you're adapting a beloved story. So. absolutely and i mean yeah you don't need to look very far for like poor examples of video game adaptations like you know just think of assassin's creed like As- what- that's the golden goose of like doing a bad job like- oh my god horrendous horrendous job of adapting uh, a narrative into mm-hmm. live action format so yes kudos to the creators on this and i mean this 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 whole piece like i think is such uh like it's definitely going to be like one of the top TV shows, I think, of this year. And, mm-hmm. you know, the next season, assuming it continues with this kind of quality, I think it's going to continue to be a very strong series for HBO. So, yes, they hit they hit they hit they hit pay dirt here. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would like to say too, just performances across the board are really uh, great and are they're all able to make the characters their own. While, um, I mean, despite. Yeah having pretty iconic previous portrayals by other performers and despite making them their own, they still feel like those people. Like you're watching the show and you're like, that's Joel, that's Ellie. Like it's, yes, it's exactly as it needs to be. I think. I agree. Yeah. The characters definitely feel like real people. Like, you know, I, I feel like with, and and with, with this series, I know they were very intentional about never using the word zombie, but this is kind of a zombie thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but the I feel like you look at Walking Dead, you look at like all these other kind of like mm-hmm. um, pieces of zombie cinema and the characters don't feel like real people. They feel like idiots. You know, they they're making these stupid decisions. Uh, they're not thinking things through. Um, they're bickering or arguing internally over these trivial matters. And you don't see any of that in this series, really. And I think that's uh, like it feels more accurate to reality, like especially in this kind of post-apocalyptic world, everyone mm-hmm. understands the stakes. the The playing field has been leveled, you know, and mm-hmm. so I think everyone's on a very similar page and wavelength, and they're acting like like all the characters, not even just our leads, but like everyone across the board feels like they're real. You know what I mean? Well, I, I think it uh it that plays into this idea that, and I, not, this isn't really a spoiler. It's just how the show starts, but. The main mm-hmm. story is a couple decades after this outbreak happens. So we're yeah. we're seeing a world that has evolved as best it can to dealing with this type of shit. Uh, whereas in, in something like The Walking Dead, we start off with Rick waking up in the hospital and like six to eight weeks have passed or something. So we're yeah. we're basically entering the world of The Last of Us five years after The Walking Dead ends in its timeline, I suppose. Mm-hmm. 
But in something like The Walking Dead, you know, like they as they get good at killing zombies, zombies suddenly get uh, the ability to just be silent when they're off screen, even though they're incredibly loud and annoying in every other yeah. instance. They- <laughs> 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 but it uh, yeah, it's the series is about a lot of things, I would say. Yes. But the ultimate thematic through line about this show is that The Last of Us is about love. And uh, what that does to each of us, both for better and for worse. Um, yeah, it really examines every angle of what it means to love someone and what that can do to you. Oh yes, yes it does. It's very. It feels like a very human humanizing mm-hmm. uh, piece of art. Um, it illustrates these complexities of human life uh, very clearly and properly. But I think it also. Um, highlights the absurdity of morality in this kind of world and you know ethics kind of get thrown up into the air too at the same time because like you said everyone's kind of end goal here is survival and just love you know Mm -hmm. and that's why you're surviving because of the love you know everyone just loves to love you know (laughs) and loves to feel love so yeah the the and and like that's an essential ingredient of life right and i think I, I think the series is asking a lot of the viewers in terms of empathy, and that mm-hmm. will continue to be the case with the series going forward. But it, uh, and I can't say too much about all of that without getting into spoilers. So, like a couple final thoughts. Um, it just illustrates the lengths that people will go to for the ones they love and mm-hmm. uh, the weight that comes with that. I, I really don't have anything negative to say about this. Yeah. Season. I, it, it's it's wonderful it's bleak uh not for everybody some um some friends of ours did not really enjoy it uh but mm-hmm. i would say if you are a fan of like darker stuff or just really emotional stories and can handle a bleak apocalyptic setting i would say you should probably watch it <laughs> yeah well and i think it's um you can view this the, the, this series from like a literary standpoint or like a symbolic standpoint or just like, you know, an analytical standpoint. That's what I meant to say. Not mm-hmm. because it's like it is so poetic. There's so many parallels. There's a lot of foreshadowing. There's these really well thought out ideas. It's romantic. Like mm-hmm. you could probably write a whole dissertation on just like the an analysis of this series because I feel like there's so many just like through lines, but then also like things that come full circle, yep. things that are like adjacent to each other you know like like getting a little bit into spoilers but like you know there's some antagonist parallels with our protagonist there's some Mm -hmm. stuff about like how the cordyceps spreads that like they're very intentional i'll talk about that in a bit but i just appreciate just how poetic the series is it's wonderful i only have a few complaints and they're more nitpicky things Mm -hmm. but yeah i agree (laughs) dylan there's a lot like most of the series i just love i can't really like find a fault in um so those walking dead writers or whatever the fall the walking dead or whatever they better be taking notes because this is a superior product to anything they've created <laughs> well the walking dead started out pretty strong too in fair oh sure yeah it's like it, did. it just got it just went on too long and it yes. doesn't seem like that'll be an issue here but i i will say one one final thought is the series really does a great job of uh priming you for its themes uh, mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. as the season goes on uh but with that let's transition into spoilers just so we can have a little bit more fun talking about it and let's uh, do it. yeah so this story is what's known as a picaresque and what that means is just it's a series of like episodic adventures uh and apparently usually follows like dishonest but sort of uh engaging and empathetic heroes which I think describes this perfectly, but like, you know, stories where the main yeah. character goes from place to place and interacts with different sets of characters in each of those is uh, what's known as a peak arrest. And that is this. So we are going to go through the story sort of arc by arc to keep it a little bit organized. Yeah. I um, think that's fair. I hadn't heard that term before. That's really neat. <laughs> an Eng- a high school English teacher used it and I thought it was a great word. So I've kept it in the back of my brain for a long time. But um, the episodic nature of this show really uh, gives the writing ample opportunities to sort of uh, 
prime us for the emotional state Joel will be in in the season finale and uh, mm-hmm. gives us the opportunity to understand why he takes the actions he does. Uh, we see this through multiple uh we see similar circumstances in multiple different characters across these arcs and i think that's what i meant by it's priming you for the end it really uh, i like knowing where the story goes maybe people even think it was laying it on a little bit too thick (laughs) (laughs) well i appreciate the all these different like arcs that we get because they Mm -hmm. are all so distinctive with each other but you're correct they all have this unifying theme, this through message about the love um, that we have for each other. It's yeah, basically the things we do for love, <laughs> the series. <laughs> we'll do anything here. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it just like that. It kind of reminded me of that moment early on in game of Thrones where Jamie yeah. Lannister just looks back at Cersei and is like, ah, the things we do for love shoves the kid out a window. <laughs> um, Brand the broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. Uh, uh, but but uh, it's also just a great, like I talked about it already, but a great adaptation because in, in the game, you play almost exclusively as Joel. There's, I think at the very beginning, you play as Sarah for a couple minutes. And then uh, towards the end, when Joel is injured, you, you play as Ellie, which is a big moment in the game. Uh, but the show is not, or in the, so the story of the game is pretty much restricted to events that Joel is present for. Yeah. The show is not bound by that limitation, uh, so it takes the opportunity to really expand on storylines and characters outside of Joel and Ellie, which I think leads to a lot of really rich and interesting additions to the narrative that give us a bigger painting of what this world is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's so true, and I appreciated, like I said, all the extra narratives that we get. They're very unique. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the there. yeah, no, I bet we we get a couple cold opens to the early episodes as well, mm-hmm. which I the the first two episodes both had them. Uh and I think the one in the finale with yeah, Ellie's mom did. is cold open as well. Yeah. But the the first one is in the sixties and they these like epidemiologists are talking about different disease types, and then one of them just talks about the fungus disease and how it can spread and how it if it happens, we lose, which is what happens in the show and then the second episode we get that um doctor who like realizes what's going on and you know it all falls apart after that both of them were really great scenes i think that really give us a sense of before that we don't get in the game so i liked Mm -hmm. that but our main narrative uh the first arc is the shortest arc of the show but i think we have to start at the beginning with sarah um Massive credit to actress Nico Parker, who I think carried much of the show's first half hour on her shoulders as she's essentially for the protagonist for the first chunk of the episode. What did you think about uh, this half hour sort of prologue to the story almost? Well, I really appreciated this um, this prologue um, for several reasons. So, you know. Obviously, it adds a lot of emotional weight to Mm -hmm. Joel's character and provides, uh, you know, great background on how on his perspective of the end of the world, you know, the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Um, And it provides uh, fitting motivation for later on in the series as he, you know, basically adopts Ellie as his Mm -hmm. surrogate daughter. Yeah. But one other thing that I really liked about this sequence, too, is. I don't I don't know how much you remember from the first episode, but they keep talking about these foods mm-hmm. uh, like pancakes, cake, um, biscuits. The all neighbor these things. lady is being fed biscuits and yes. they offer some to Joel and he says no. And yeah, that's, I'm that's on Atkins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they also talk about baking cookies at the old woman's house. And it's like, oh, I would have eaten one of those cookies, but it was raisin. at like they made a very clear reason. They're like, oh, it's ra- raisin, not chocolate chip. Mm-hmm. And then we learn in episode three how the virus spread or not the virus, the, the, the cordyceps. Fungus. 
yeah, yeah. it comes from the food supply that mm -hmm. it somehow got it was in into, the grain. Yeah, it was in the grain, and then it just kind of spread through all these prepackaged products of yeah that you use for for pancake mix, right? And cake mix and biscuits and stuff like, like that. Like it was in some distribution center, and it got sent yeah. all over the country. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I just thought like I rewatched that episode with my girlfriend because I got her into it, mm -hmm. and it was just blowing my mind that they included <laughs> that much those like small little details, <laughs> and it's like oh. Joel missed all of these opportunities to get <laughs> to get infected. Mm -hmm. And it was because they kept making mistake and mistake and mistake of like, oh, I forgot the pancake mix. Oh, I forgot the bread or like yeah. you know, all this other stuff. So it's like, I just thought that was a really neat piece of attention to detail that I really, oh, really yeah. enjoyed. Um, but what what, were, what what did you think of this? Uh, yeah, I and on, on the note of the fungus itself, apparently this fungus is inspired by something real that happens to ants. Yep. There's a fungus yep. that like takes over their brain and and basically puppets them like zombies, uh, which is yeah. pretty fucking freaky. But uh... footage of it, footage of it is bizarre. Yeah, like <laughs> it is so weird. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, as far as we know, this is not actually possible to spread through humans. So thank you for that universe. <laughs> um, but thank Sarah, God. Sarah being essentially the protagonist for this first chunk really makes it extra devastating when she's killed. Yes. And uh, and she's so likable and she's so fun as a character. And I remember when the game came out, every uh, you you start the game as Sarah and uh, mm -hmm. every game critic in their review described having the same feeling and just being like, oh, no, this isn't the girl on the box art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> and ah. just having that moment of realization because her death is fucking crushing. And um, this is also the first deviation from the game because in a video game, uh, you know, you have to get to the gameplay pretty quickly, like within yes. the first yeah. 10 minutes, I would say, because both of us have probably played games that don't do that. And boy, let me tell you, is it really fucking annoying when a game does it's... not let you play for an extended mm -hmm. period of time at the start. Um but oh, yeah. the show does not have to get to gameplay as quickly. So this this first half hour is like the first six to ten minutes of the game, I think. Uh, so it's it. So we really get to spend time with Sarah. She like goes into downtown Austin to get mm -hmm. Joel a gift and um, lots of good stuff. But I, I think seeing everything fall apart through her eyes was a really brilliant creative decision. Uh, and yeah. We, and it, it's like that in the game, too, because we're playing as her until the car crash and her she can't walk. And that is when you play as Joel finally in the game. And that's sort of where the point of view switches in the show as well. So it's a really creative adaptation of that element of the game. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Sarah's death, though, of course, sets up Joel's primary character arc and motivation for the rest of the show because yeah. he has lost his daughter. And uh, he doesn't know it at first, but he is looking to fill that void. So, yeah, well, that that whole sequence is just, yeah, devastating is the word of the day, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> devastating. Um, yeah, because this is just so emotionally impactful. He, his daughter literally dies in his arms. Like, how can you get more poetic than that? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just yeah. so it just it's a gut punch, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I agree. The way that they you know, communicate the unfolding of events through her eyes is it just feels real, you know, mm -hmm. like all the stuff going on, like it's happening in the background, like the cop cars going by, she doesn't really notice it, but then there's like stuff going on in the news that she's not really paying attention yes. to. And then, you know, she's like in her bed and then she wakes up and there's explosions outside mm -hmm. in the far off distance. Like, holy shit, this is getting real, real fast. Like, Yeah. Well, and Joel <laughs> is not there. Where is mm -hmm. Joel? Like, why is it taking him so long to get back? And then when they're in the car, the camera is in the back seat with her. So we're we're seeing all of these events and the chaos and the fear that comes from that from the point of view of this child. And obviously, like Joel and Tommy don't know what the hell's going on either, but seeing it through the eyes of a kid makes it feel all the more terrifying, I think. Yes. And yes. then all the more devastating when that kid does not make it past the first half hour of the show. Um Yeah. No, that's that was that was devastating. Yeah. But it provides, yeah, a great emotional crux for our protagonist, Joel, um, and his future development. And after that, 
initial 30 minutes, we get into um, it, it transitions 20 years into the future yeah. to big time jump. Yeah, big but time Joel jump. is still wearing the watch, the broken watch that Sarah got for him because he has never moved on. Um, yeah, so. oh, it's sad. Yes, but we uh, we get to the sort of establishment of the new, the ordinary world uh, in mm-hmm. storytelling terms. And uh, as well, like we get a really good introduction into what the world looks like now. The quarantine zones run by this sort of fascist police state, Fedra. And uh, we get a lot of information about what people do in this society. Like you you sign up for different day jobs and you get food stipends or money or something based on that. They have a, a system for like if someone looks like they're sick, here's what you do. That little kid shows up outside and they have a a system for checking if people are infected and killing them if they are <laughs> yeah and uh, uh we also get our introduction to marlene and the fireflies and a little bit of an idea of what they're about but not a whole lot about what they're about because we never really get much about what their mission statement is do we <laughs> no we don't they just kind of seem like a terrorist cell <laughs> for lack of a better word but they are tech- yeah freedom fighters i guess mm-hmm. under this fascist kind of police state um yeah which is interesting to just think about like how the government's you know structure of government develops in a post-apocalyptic world Mm -hmm. and of course i think yeah fascist policies would probably reign supreme (laughs) yeah because they're all about power and control and (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah it makes uh, sense (laughs) yeah and in a world where like one fuck up can cause a mass like disease spread like that is probably fertile ground for fascists to gain power i would say <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean the the boston arc is uh very interesting because yeah it does a good job of quickly introducing um our side characters like mm-hmm. uh, tess and marlene so we kind of understand who they are i wish that they would have developed the relationship between joel and tess just a little bit further okay like maybe even if we had like a little bit more insight into like their adventures together like in the previous past like maybe even a flashback but whatever because i still think that they accomplished you know establishing that they were in a relationship and that they had mm-hmm. spent a lot of time together but i think that they could have just spent maybe a little bit longer on that um okay and yeah but i think you know they did a good job of quickly establishing ellie too and i like her introduction of just like just kind of locked up in this room by by the fireflies because they're like we don't know what to do with her what is she like yeah well they were, they were waiting to make sure that she doesn't turn right and yeah she, exactly and yeah. they had to keep her locked up but I, I think the I actually thought the relationship between Joel and Tess was introduced uh, really well. And I uh, I yeah. connected with Tess enough that when she died, I was pretty sad about it. Her death is also very um, it's a great scene. Another, another mm-hmm. deviation from the game and the game. They're being chased by the army from Fedra when they get to oh. the, the museum or whatever. Or not the museum, the the gold domed building that they go to. I don't know what it is. Um, I think it was a museum, but I can't remember. They go through a museum, but they're going to city hall. Oh yes. Yes. That's right. Um, But in the, in the show they're chased by infected because one of them that they shoot like touches the tendril. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I love how she blows up the whole building and the weird infected, like puts its little tendrils in her mouth. It's really fucking gross. And (laughs) um, but a little bizarre. Yeah excellent tension in that action scene with the clickers though in the museum because they we've kind of seen them before episode two but we don't really get to interact with them until that and uh they're Mm -hmm. kind of terrifying and we don't get to see a lot of them in the show but when they show up it's very effective yeah no the 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 makeup and the costume design is really excellent on the on the the infected Mm -hmm. and just in general i think yeah across the board like all the people all the survivors and stuff like how they're dressed and everything it's it's very real Mm -hmm. it's very accurate and i really do appreciate the effort that all those people are doing on the production design and the costume design and everything (laughs) yeah good job uh, yeah the first arc is really it's a really great opening act to this story i would say and the story starts in earnest when tess is bitten and realizes that like Ellie's immunity is real and it's worth fighting for. And she charges Joel to go above their mandate because the people they were supposed to meet are dead um, and mm-hmm. get, yeah. Cause that's Joel's motivation at the start, right? He wants to get a car battery. So he, so he could go find his brother because his brother has gone silent. And, uh, 
And it, it's at this point where the Joel and Ellie relationship is really starting to begin. And yes. uh, and with that, we move into our next arc, a one episode arc, but the Bill and Frank arc, an, ex- mm-hmm. an expansion and change from the game, because like I said earlier, Joel's our point of view character in the game. So we don't really get things like this that are outside of his um, area. So uh, mm-hmm. one of the strongest episodes of recent television, in my opinion, the Bill and Frank episode. <laughs> it's really touching. It's uh, it's just beautiful in general. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's a very unique story to tell, um, you know, in a world full of infected where you're so alone and you're just trying to survive mm-hmm. somehow a love story is possible and a love story between two rednecks you know <laughs> like, kind of yeah. out in the middle of the woods it's it's endearing and it's touching um mm-hmm. i really enjoyed it uh because yeah it's just a doomsday prepper um just kind of uh eventually just discovers a relationship with this guy yeah. wandering through the woods and, and discovers his sexuality really mm-hmm. or at least yes. accepts it i would say and it, it's uh and that's another thing we didn't put a note in it about it but i i think it's just such a healthy and good representation of uh, a same sex relationship between two men, which I think is far more rare mm-hmm. to see on mainstream TV and movies than even same sex relationships between women. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's just a love story. It's just like we basically get a feature length romance starring Nick Offerman <laughs> yeah. in the middle of this show, which is wonderful. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's just like really heartwarming and wholesome and it makes you cry, but in a different way than the show has made you cry before because mm-hmm. these two characters get to have a whole life together and we get to see it play out and it's paced perfectly and it has a very sad but fulfilling ending as well, I think. It's just really, really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... yeah. It's just, it's, it's emotionally impactful. Um, and I, you know, I, I agree. Yeah. I definitely cried <laughs> both times that I watched it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just, it, it pulls you down, but yeah, I'm very happy that we got to see such a beautiful romance mm-hmm. bud in this very depressing reality. Um, and, you know, on the, on the same side too, um, I feel like there's a lot of parallels between Bill, mm-hmm. um, our doomsday prepper, and Joel's character, and they kind of spell it out a little bit. Yeah, um, and his, his letter. It like, was to his Joel. letter of just being like, "Oh yeah, we're both protectors with a purpose," kind of deal. But you know, it's true. They they both do care for these individuals that kind of stumbled into their lives. Mm-hmm. They're kind of these protectors of them, and that's kind of their sole purpose is just caring for these people. Um, and just finding purpose through that. And then, you know, they're both, they've both been alone for so long uh, previously, and they've just kind of had this void in their life that they need filled, but mm-hmm. they don't exactly know what that is. And then it right. just kind of comes across their way and they're both tightly round, tightly wound. They're practical people. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's just, it's great to just see those kind of parallels already starting to emerge this yes. early on in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, even if, even if Bill and, um joel didn't like each other or bill didn't like joel (laughs) it was still kind of like yeah they both respect each other and see exactly who they are you know they're and they're they're like allies in this world even though they're not friends necessarily and and uh bill's note to joel tells him to like protect tess but of course tess is already gone at this point so joel's protector instincts are now being transferred on to protect ellie this new Mm. person in his life and I think the episode is so great because it works both as a standalone story in a lot of ways, but it also mm-hmm. deeply informs Joel's character for the rest of the season. Uh, and it's it's just another example of this story is about love and the different ways love impacts us. This is one of the nicer ways we see love impacting people throughout the show. Yes. And that's the the dark side of this show is that Love can make you do really, really horrible things, which is a uh, a big part of the Kansas City arc, which we're about to transition into. But do you have any more thoughts on the Bill and Frank saga before we move on? I mean, the only thing that I would add is that, yeah, you're right. It is. This is 
one of the more positive ways to represent the power of love and mm -hmm. what it can do in your life, the impacts that it can have, because ultimately it pulled a prepper out from his basement. You know, yeah. it kind of pulled it him made out him a shell. better person. It made him a better person and it made him develop a unique appreciation for life too mm -hmm. and just changed him for the better. But, you know, it's uh it's one of the few happy stories in yeah. a post apocalyptic world. <laughs> Yeah, and, and not the same thing and not for the same reasons, but in just like just now, it kind of reminded me of like the apocalypse and the circumstances that he found himself in made Bill a better person than he was mm -hmm. before. And it just kind of reminded me of Daryl in The Walking Dead, obviously not due to romantic love or being gay or anything like that. But like Daryl um, becomes a better person in the years following the apocalypse than he was before. Right. Remember? Like early yes. Daryl is kind of a racist redneck and he becomes like one of the most loved characters in the show over the first four seasons or so because he grows as a person. He becomes a leader and a stand up guy. Um, mm -hmm. So just an interesting thing. But uh, yeah, super happy we got this episode and it's an expansion from the game because uh, we don't see any of that. And also Bill is still alive when Joel and Ellie find him in the game and he dies before they get here in the show. But mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um. That that this is the episode where Neil Druckmann said like if it's better we change it for the show and they felt yeah. it was more poetic to have Bill uh die with Frank and I think it was I think that was the right choice. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think that was much more beautiful that way and romantic. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let's talk about um the dark side of love now with the Kansas City arc and Kathleen and Henry. Um, yes. Yeah, Another expansion is... to the game story because these are just like enemy forces in the game from what I understand mm -hmm. and they really took the opportunity to humanize them here. And the guy who plays Tommy in the games is the right hand man of Kathleen. The guy with the big gray beard is Tommy. In the oh, game. that's cool. Right and on. Our, I think he's our first cameo by the game's main cast. We have more later on, but yeah, cool. So. <laughs> oh, that poor dude. <laughs> Gets, gets fucking ripped to shreds. He does. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think this is such a interesting arc too because of not, not, not just the characters we meet, but kind of going back to the um, government structures that we were mm -hmm. talking about in the Boston QZ out in yeah. Kansas City, we learned that Fedra has really been kind of abusing their power and just like, you know, more so than the other spots. Yeah. Yes, more so than Boston. Like this is like a fascist state turned up to kind of eleven, where it's just like the people have no power, mm -hmm. and the you know military officials, the government officials can just kind of like rape and plunder and kill and do whatever they want, and um, kind of have the uh, the the people kind of under their heel. Um, and that's how it's that's how it was described to us through our our characters like Sam and, uh, and Kathleen. But then, mm -hmm. you know, it is also kind of interesting because Kathleen, when she becomes the leader after they revolt and turn over Fedra in this QZ, uh, she kind of starts to abuse her own power and just tries to exact revenge on these Fedra mm -hmm. informers, specifically Sam uh, or Henry. I can't remember exactly which was which, but. You know, Henry Henry's the older brother and Sam. Okay, is... Henry. Yeah, so yeah. She's Henry. after she's after Henry and she wants to get to him through Sam, through hurting Sam. That's her revenge. Right. Yes. And yeah, but the by the time we get to Kansas City, the the uprising has occurred and Kathleen's group is in power over Fedra, right? And mm -hmm. lots of parallels and foreshadowing uh to Joel and where he'll be later on in the season. And also maybe some parallels to a character that we haven't met yet in the show, uh, but mm. we'll meet later on. I'm less familiar with some of the intricacies of part two's plot, but maybe there's some parallel there. I don't know. Who uh, knows? <laughs> but she is looking for Fedra informants because uh, her brother was killed by Fedra, I believe. For, yes. and like He was like the initial revolution leader and he got killed by Fedra because Henry uh, sold them out basically to protect Sam. Henry was a Fedra informant. And I think Henry's behavior is also a great indicator for Joel's arc as he is willing to get other people killed or kill other people in the protection of, of Sam, just like yeah. Joel will be for Ellie. So I think we get a lot of, again, another, just another example of like this series is really laying it on thick. It's like, these are, 
These are people who love the people around them and will cross moral lines to keep them safe. And Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, well, you know, oh, go ahead. In in such a world, you know, does morality really have a place? You know, I I think that's kind of like a a, an idea that they bring to the surface in this Mm -hmm. series too. You know, we're gonna have a big discussion about that at the end. Oh, sure. But don't worry, audience. We we can get into that for sure. But I think that's definitely a prevalent thing here too. Of like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it really worth it to to do all this stuff just to just to protect one person or to get back at one person? Mm-hmm. Like Kathleen just kind of goes on this revenge streak, you know. And then, but like I remember, even like one point, like uh, I think that uh, uh, her right hand man kind of just like turns to her and says, like, "Well, what about this other stuff that we should be doing? Like, why are we putting so much energy mm-hmm. into like finding this guy?" And she's like, "Is this not your top priority?" Well, it's yeah, mine. and then there's like the the like sagging in the building or whatever that's foreshadowed and it turns out to be all the infected. And you're right. She's neglecting that problem because she's on a personal vendetta. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, which, which leads to probably the most infected we see in the entire show, including that big bloater and all of them. And it's like it, that, that scene as they're escaping Kansas city and Kathleen's forces catch up to them. It really illustrates like, Oh, this is why the world fell. This is why it happened. They, they, they got overwhelmed by this shit. I get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and I feel like, you know, because they said they, they they drove them underground into kind of like mm-hmm. the sewer system, right, of Kansas City. So I was just like, it's just kind of fascinating to think like, oh, the infected are just like all kind of grouping there. They're kind of festering. Like mm-hmm. the bloater kind of bloated. You know, he became stronger and tougher to kill. So it's just like, actually, that whole side of things is just kind of fascinating to think about, yeah. like what happens over time in a kind of isolated environment for these, mm-hmm. for the, the infected population. Yeah. And uh, one thing I'd forgotten about until just now, but while uh, Joel, Ellie, Henry and Sam are like underground getting out of town, they come across this uh, community that was there, like a little schoolhouse underground. That oh, this, right, yeah. this like community that had hit out there obviously died off at some point, but we get a moment of like just children playing and having fun with Ellie and Sam, which Mm -hmm. in true Last of Us fashion is giving us a a glimpse and a little glimmer of hope before very rudely ripping it away from us a few minutes later. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because in that big action scene, Sam, poor little Sam, gets bit. uh, And Mm. uh, he, I, what is it? He asked Ellie, like, if you if you become a monster, are you still you inside or something like yeah. that? And she tries to like rub her blood in his wounds to help him. Of course that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's, that's not how it works, but yeah, it's, that was a very devastating, <laughs> the word of the day, devastating <sighs> because yeah, that was um, just very devastating. Cause you do have some hope that maybe her blood could save him and then it doesn't. And it's, it's just it's also just kind of devastating when you when you kind of pay attention to that dialogue between uh henry and joel while the kids Mm -hmm. are playing they're talking about this concept of you know enduring and surviving um they sure they sure did not in that oh no no they don't (laughs) like yeah even though even though his brother died he was just like nope can't do this anymore i'm not going to endure survive there's no yeah. point in moving on it's, well yeah. w- which is another parallel to joel actually because yeah when when sam dies henry kills himself immediately which we find out in the finale joel tried to do the same after sarah died and mm-hmm. he he failed this is the way he says it um and yeah just another example of the show priming us for joel in the finale but i, I this episode is also a great uh, dive into the show asking us to have empathy for people and the people of this world to have empathy for each other because at first when Henry tells Joel that he was an informant and that he was selling people out like Joel says he doesn't work with rats or whatever right yeah and then later on in the episode he's kind of like I understand why you did it and he is able to work with Henry for a little bit because he's able to have that empathy and understanding that in a similar situation he might do the same thing uh (laughs) and um, yeah (laughs) but kathleen in contrast is unable to have that empathy her brother died and she wants blood and she's unable to get past that and it's not that she's an evil person i don't think she is an evil person she's just 
hurt yeah. and angry, and now she has power. And yeah, that's you know. And I think that's yeah, that's that's kind of just how some villains are made. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, one thing too that I'll say too uh, on this was um, I, I appreciated uh, that the uh, actor uh, who played. Uh, little Sam mm-hmm. uh, was a you know actual deaf actor. Um, you know it's nice to see that kind of representation. And I did find out that uh, the cast learned ASL yeah. um, prior to filming, so that's really neat that they kind of took that initiative and mm-hmm. they're giving these kinds of roles to um, you know actors who actually um, right match. And that yeah. and that was an addition for the show too. Sam in the in the game, I do not believe is deaf, but they decided to make this change and they and they don't shy away from like the challenges that would come with that in a post-apocalypse like if you have flesh-eating monsters chasing you and you can't hear like that is that's putting you in a lot of danger which is you know really a bummer (laughs) well yeah i mean there's so many logistical things that i think about sometimes of like oh yeah i have to wear contacts all the time in an apocalypse Mm -hmm. i if i lose my glasses i'm fucked i can't i'm dying i can't i can't there's no workaround for that (laughs) yeah and you can't there's nowhere to take them to repair them like if you if you tripped yeah and you fell on like rocks or something glass oh oh, no more seeing for you yeah it's like that it's like that twilight episode of that of that guy and he's like i have all this time to read all these books now and then his glasses break he's like but now i can't (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah, so we we leave this arc. I would say uh, the as they bury Henry and Sam, I think this is the the moment where the shift happens in Joel. And I think they talk about this in the inside the episode too. It's um, Joel sees Ellie walking away from the graves and look at looks at the graves and starts having a thought that like I can't do this again. Like I'm starting to care about this kid, and one mm-hmm. of these days. I'm going to have to put her in the ground, I think is kind of how they were saying it. And it's like, it's like, he's realizing he's starting to have an emotional connection and it's scary to him, which I think plays into some of his behavior in what we'll call the the winter arc, uh, which we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Jackson hole. We're going to talk about the flashback episode with Ellie. And we're going to talk about the cannibal section here. But I, I think that, idea sort of plays into Joel starting to push Ellie away once they get to Jackson Hole um because mm-hmm. and it leads to the great you're not my daughter and I certainly ain't your dad scene which is word for word from the game and uh, also him trying to shunt her off on Tommy because he thinks he's bad for the people around him and he'll get her killed and yeah. and that's and then that's like a, a defense for him. I think he's both trying to like protect her, but also protect himself because he won't be able to emotionally handle it if she gets hurt as a result of him. So uh, what what are yeah. your thoughts on some of the things in this very uh, big arc that we're going to lump together? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot of ground to cover. Um, but I think like to start off with, I enjoyed the jackson hole uh sequence i mean mm. i enjoyed all of it um i think the cannibals arc was or the cannibals portion was probably the part that i enjoyed the most yeah. but it is nice to get these kind of uh insight into the jackson hole area this this community that has been able to like hide itself and survive and actually mm-hmm. thrive is you know it's encouraging and it's it's kind of nice to right. see this, this nice kind of blip of hope right after we had this like pit of despair in kansas city you know it's kind Mm -hmm. of a nice like lift back up of like okay yes there is a little bit of hope there is kind of something here yes Um, so i i enjoyed that and it was just kind of nice to get that reunion between joel and um tommy tommy thank you yeah um you know because i kind of when i first started the series and it started going i kind of imagined that was going to be like episode nine they get reunited i thought that was kind of going to be like the final thing Mm -hmm. so it's interesting that they that it was earlier you know and yeah then it kind of gets that out of the way and it's like okay what next let's let's kind of move on but um it is it is an interesting point there too because i agree that joel is grappling internally with these um competing concerns mm-hmm. of well i care for her but if i keep going down this road i know it's going to devastate me again yeah and i might end up with a gun next to my head all over again mm-hmm. you know kind of he knows himself pretty well yes i think 
Uh, and but I, I also just a side note, it's the, there's that funny part where um, Joel is like, oh, so you're like communist. And Tommy's like, no, nah, nothing, nothing like that. And his wife is like, no, it's exactly like that. This is a commune. We're communists. This is what we do. And it's uh, I, I saw yeah. it pointed out <laughs> somewhere online. And I think it's true. It's like most Americans, like if you ask them about the concepts that exist under communism or socialism, they're like, oh, that sounds really good. Like, that's a really good idea. And then you tell them it's like, that's communism. It's like, never. <laughs> Absolutely <Yeah. laughs> not. <laughs> but, that's uh, a bad word. Yeah. Ah! But uh, it, the, yeah, this arc starts with a lot of a lot of hope, right? We, yeah. we get to see that uh, Native American couple living in their little house. They're funny and quippy. And uh, they're just, you know, they seem to be doing all right. And then we are chilling. And then we find uh, Tommy in Jackson Hole, who is not only alive, but is thriving and is married and has a kid on the way. And uh, and it it this section is showing us that there's potential for not just survival, but a good life in this mm -hmm. world. And that's, I think, very important going into the end of the show that. Yeah. There is there is potential for goodness in this uh, world. And Joel wants that life, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and could, could you remind me, were Joel and uh, uh, Tommy brothers or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they're brothers. Okay, yeah, they're brothers. Tommy's his little brother. And, right, uh, yes. And, and Joel may, and Tommy was a firefly at one point, too. Joel has that comment about how Tommy's always looking for a cause. He joined the army when he was young. Right. And yeah. that didn't really work out. And then after the apocalypse, he joined the Fireflies and has mm -hmm. since left the Fireflies. I don't remember exactly why, but yeah, I don't remember either. I don't know I if think, it tells us. Yeah, I can't remember. But I think, you know, that whole sequence of um, just reuniting uh, mm -hmm. with a family member is uplifting. But it, it is kind of an interesting like uh, like difference there because he's got his adopted family and then he's got his real family both, mm -hmm. both 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 tommy and joel have their adopted and their real families that's true yeah which is interesting to think about because i think that this uh reunion kind of also serves as like a final goodbye between the two of them of like okay we know that we're both kind of going our own ways and we know that each okay. other's okay right now that's like you know it, it just kind of felt like that moment because they both realize who they're connected to and even though they'll always have their back as brothers it just it to me it felt like they knew that, that they're never going to see each other again <laughs> yeah and i thought it was pretty honest in a way too because it's not like their reunion is super hunky dory either like they're they're really elated to see each other but then when they're in the bar having a drink together like old wounds kind of start coming out and yeah. they're like their relationship is obviously somewhat contentious and that doesn't stop just because they haven't seen. Oh, hi Kevin. <laughs> and that doesn't stop just because they haven't seen each other for a long time. So it's like after the initial joy of the reunion, they kind of fall back into their old habits a little bit and wound each other. Um, even though ultimately they're still uh, each other's brothers and are going to help, you know? Yeah. Well, and it, I like that scene too, because it provides some extra context around Joel's backstory. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, we just get this big time jump. We don't know what Joel did for those like 20 X 20 years, years or whatever, yeah. you know? So it's like, he could have done so many different things, but then Tommy starts talking about, oh yeah, we killed people. We didn't do things. We killed people. Yeah. And it gives you this idea of like, oh yeah. When Marlene mentioned earlier, like in the first episode, I know what you're capable of. That's mm -hmm. what Joel's capable of. He's capable of killing people in cold blood, like doing these horrible, horrible things. Yeah. And it's like, okay, we just get a small insight and that's just a little bit more foreshadowing mm -hmm. of what's to come in these next few episodes. Right. And, and it paints a picture too. It's like, uh, obviously they would have taken time to set up these big quarantine zones and these systems mm -hmm. of government and walls and, and like procedures and stuff like that. And while that was happening, the world was falling apart and people were, fighting for resources and trying to survive and people crossed lines and mm -hmm. uh there's a great uh neil Druckmann. i, I forget uh, which of the creators says this but in in the pilot uh when joel acts violently in protection of sarah at the beginning she's she's horrified and then in at the end of the episode when joel kills that fedra guard to protect ellie so he doesn't mm -hmm. kill her um the i think they say like she's activated 
Like she likes having someone protect her in this way. And that's mm. a big contrast between Sarah and Ellie. And it also is um, building up this personality trait in Ellie that uh, that David in his episode even calls out, like you have a violent heart, I think is the line, right? And and mm-hmm. she does. All of our characters we're following here have that. <laughs> they um <laughs> they tend it, to, yeah. Yeah, but the, that episode ends with a great cliffhanger as Joel is stabbed by one of these people they run into by happenstance. And uh, Ellie and Joel escape from the rest of them, but Joel passes out maybe dies leaving Ellie to fend for herself. And that is the cliffhanger for the episode that leads <laughs> us into a flashback episode. Oh my God. Uh, ah! <laughs> yeah. So this uh, storyline in this episode was not in the original game. It was actually DLC for the game uh, oh, to give us a little oh, bit cool. of backstory into Ellie's uh, life. And it introduces us to Ellie's friend and crush Riley, as well as the trauma that Ellie has been carrying the entire time that we just did. Yeah. Know, right. And um, I think this episode was really great and it shows us very subtly at first how Ellie likes Riley and kind of wants to be more than friends. It's like she's checking her appearance in the window of that shop. She keeps looking at her on the merry-go-round. It's very cute. It's just Mm -hmm. like it's like a, a teenager like trying to feel out like if the feeling's mutual, you know, it's very yeah it it feels kind of like a coming of age story of mm-hmm. like oh it's my kind of first romance kind of deal and like i don't know do they like me do they not like it's mm-hmm. kind of crush dynamic and i mean you know in a post-apocalyptic world like this where they've grown up in such a regimented structured like soci- like environment mm-hmm. with fedra and everything you know your opportunity for romance and love is it feels limited um, yeah. very restricted and i think these two ellie and riley it feels like that they always felt like outsiders mm-hmm. and that's definitely what was communicated to us like when ellie kind of has that confrontation with the with the other girl and you know gives her stitches uh at the start of the episode um where it's just like yeah you guys are kind of the outsiders so it's like in in such a environment you know, you you kind of have to take what you can get. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying that, that that either of them settled or anything like that. What I'm saying more is that, you know, take the moments it, it's, you it's, get. It's, sort yes, of. it's a, it's a it's, yeah, it's like it's you take these small, you enjoy these small little moments and you find the diamond in the rough, mm-hmm. you know, and that's kind of what this relationship is, that they found each other and they connected. And it's it is a beautiful episode, honestly. It's yeah. an innocent and joyous episode. And and you're right. It does feel very much like a coming of age story. It's like they're sneaking out at night. They're going yes. into the secret <laughs> place, the mall, and they're having an awesome time. They get to play Mortal Kombat that Ellie had a poster of. And it's like it probably like read all the manuals and knew all this lore about the game that she never got mm-hmm. to play. And before we keep going on their story, I, I just... A really funny beat of this is like she gets called into the principal's office, right? Yeah, and yeah. This is this is another scene that's in a lot of coming of age stories where the principal's like, Ellie, you're a good kid. And one of these days, like if you really apply yourself, you can be the Nazi who takes people's money. And it's yeah. like <laughs> But it's like, but if you're not careful, like that other that other girl's gonna be your boss, and that's gonna really suck for you. It's just the the <laughs> contrast between what we're used to with that scene that we've seen a thousand times, and this post apocalypse like with the, where she just has like a principal cop telling her it's like yeah Look, you want to be the fascist in charge, not the subordinate fascist. <laughs> like I was onto something, but it is yeah. weird. <laughs> it what it's it's funny, but the but back to the mall like it's. It's a it's a very sweet and joyous moment. And in typical Last of Us fashion, they give us that dopamine rush of a really nice moment only to rip it away very rudely shortly after. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll just say, too, I really enjoyed like the whole mall sequence of them. Like, I'm going to show you the five or four wonders of the mall. And Ellie's just uh-huh. stunned by escalators, you know, like I know. Right. These concepts that are so like every day to us you know are just like um exotic to her uh well it's like she's the car remember in the car when they leave yeah. bills 
She's like, it's like a spaceship. And, and Joel's like, it's like a piece of shit 2003 car, but it'll do. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst fucking car I've ever been in, but she yeah. think it's amazing. Yeah. Also, I, uh, I, video viewers, apologies, because Niles was just frozen like this for 10 seconds <laughs> while you were talking. <laughs> Perfect. That's what yeah. I want. <laughs> um, But yeah, no, like I love the moment where they, they're bonding and they're like getting closer and then Ellie leans in for a little kiss and apologizes and then like for what? And because it's like, it's like a teen romance story and then, uh-oh, infected guy zooms in. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there's the, it ruins it. Yeah, and like we're introduced to the concept that he's there early in the episode. So we have this sense of impending dread, right? And then the screams are a misdirect because it's just a prank. It's kind of fucked up, honestly, writers <laughs> for doing mm. that to us emotionally. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I think the, I enjoyed this episode, but I think this is one of my complaints of the series is that okay, because you, um, they, they, they've kind of built up this, the, the small as like, you know, it's full of infected. It's like a place you shouldn't go. Like, mm-hmm. and we know, we know already that that's where Ellie got infected. Like she already told us in the second episode. So I think kind of going into this episode in the mall, that tension of when's the zombie going to come out and surprise mm-hmm. us. I think that it just kind of undercut some of the emotional buildup for me and just made me lose focus. Cause I'm just like thinking about it a little okay. bit too much of like, Oh, there's like, something's going to happen and I know it's coming. When's it going to happen? Mm-hmm. And, but you know, that's just me. Maybe it was different for okay. other people. Um, yeah, I, I didn't feel that as much. I felt it more as a uh, it was like a ticking clock that I knew was coming. And also yeah. the um, the purpose of putting the flashback here, I think. And they talk about this. The showrunners do is uh, Riley uh, th- like Ellie is almost about to like kill herself and have Riley kill herself, too, because they're going to die. And Riley's like, no, whatever time we have left we we embrace it we value it and we live it right and yeah. that is what because joel is trying to get ellie to leave him in the present day and uh that's what motivates ellie to step the fuck up and like make sure he survives it's like how however much time we have left we're going to take it and i think it i think this story beat works really well in the context of pushing that i think it worked well on its own but its placement in this spot was uh perfect and also it makes us sit on the cliffhanger that Joel was dying for an entire episode which yeah, is which is excellent. really effective you know um if you yeah if you're going to have a death fake out talked about this before but uh looking at you rise of skywalker if you're going to have a death <laughs> fake out make us think it's fucking real for more than 5 minutes <laughs> like, yeah and then don't just tell us in the next scene that the character's alive like <laughs> come on let us let us mourn that character for at least a minute exactly like, like death fake outs can absolutely work if you use too many of them in too quick of succession then people start calling bullshit but if you make the viewer feel the loss for a little bit it still has power even if they're mm-hmm. alive ultimately um but yeah r.i.p riley she was cool uh but she, she was cool. she's um yeah she was gonna stay she was gonna stay with ellie even though the fireflies told her not to and yeah that was so touching like she changed her mind and mm-hmm. yeah it was just wonderful to see that kind of friendship become a romance even if it was just for a second <laughs> yeah and now things get super fucked up uh because we meet david and his group of survivors and yes. similar to the kansas city uh arc we get a lot more information about this group than the game gave us i believe hmm. um like great and, and i'll talk more about that in a second but uh troy baker video game joel gets his cameo in this part he's david's right hand man who ellie chops with a meat cleaver <laughs> oh that guy he voiced yep. he voiced joel cool yeah, he voiced joel he's a huge uh voice actor especially in the world of video games like he is in so much stuff <laughs> cool yeah i like that i liked his performance here he was really neat uh, as a, like the right hand man yeah. um but yeah i mean this whole group uh, david's group um i i don't even really know where they were it was like was well, like Silver Lake or something like that. But yeah, I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere up there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was like, I thought it was a Colorado, but then I was like, oh, no, I don't think so. But, no, because they're going to Salt Lake is where they're trying to get to. Eventually. Yeah. 
yeah but, but yeah it's it's a very interesting um group for a lot of reasons mm -hmm. and i think one of them is the concept of religion i think that's something that really connected with me mm -hmm. um because i think like in, a, in an apocalypse in my mind everyone would automatically reject the idea of religion after the world comes crashing down like why would you still believe in anything after this but david has this unique perspective here um but at the same time if christianity survives then pedophilia has to survive for some <laughs> reason <laughs> the church can never escape the connection <laughs> no for real uh, um but <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, because David, um, great slow reveal of his true nature because he seems like a very, mm -hmm. uh, unassuming, pretty nice guy at the start. Um, yeah, but oh, oh man, he's actually a secret pedo. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, he's a yeah. terrible guy, and it, it they do reveal it very slowly mm -hmm. and at the right pace, though. Yes, yeah, because like at that first when we first see him, he's kind of like giving the servant at the funeral there. It's like very solemn. Everyone obviously mm -hmm. respects him. He's very clearly the leader, but I don't think that there's much like, like implication in that scene of like, oh, he's like a pedophile or, oh, he's like abusive or all this no. other stuff, you know? He, he just seems like a decent guy put in an impossibly tough situation and he's trying to yes. keep his people alive, right? Which to be fair, he is doing. He is doing all of that. He is the leader of this group. He does seem to actually care about them and he wants them to mm -hmm. survive. And um, there, there's a lot more nuance here because in the game, pretty much all we know about this group, from what I understand, is that they're cannibals because uh, this is the section when you play as Ellie in the game because Joel is injured. So Oh, you, this section. Okay. This is the section. And um, and so like the, the cannibalism is only seen through Ellie's point of view. But in the show, we see that like they're harvesting their people who are already dead and they're doing it because they literally have no other food. Right. And they're it's winter. They're going to starve to death if they don't do this. Still fucked up. But it but again, we're understanding like we are constantly put in situations in this show where people are doing really monstrous things, but we are given enough information. And if we have empathy as viewers, we can understand. I kind of get it. I understand mm. why they're doing it. It's it's bad, but uh, I, I like like it. Well, it dire it, straits, man. Well, yeah, dire it, straits. It, it makes you confront the question. Like if you were a leader of a community, you were about to face a really bad winter. You had no food, and you had a couple of dead bodies that you couldn't bury. What do you What are you gonna do? Would you yeah. cross that line? If you don't cross that line, and a child dies, like. Did you make the right decision? I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's well, it's well, yeah. It's it's kind of like yeah. What what things are you willing to give up, and mm -hmm. which which things are you willing to compromise on? And exactly, exact. And I'm and I'm not familiar with all the tenets of Christianity or anything like that. I would be pretty surprised. sure cannibalism isn't one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's a sin. But you know, if there's one sin that you have to do <laughs> in order to survive, you know, it's like, well, yeah. all right, you got to kind of bite the bullet or else you failed and you've come this far and you've got mm -hmm. all these people depending on you. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I, well, I, and if they're, and if they're like, it, it's, it, we're not defending cannibalism here, obviously, yes, yes, but, yes. <laughs> but it, but it does, they do make the interesting writing choice to have them. They're not killing people and eating them. There are people who have died and they're making use of those resources as morbid as that is. Uh, but at the end of the day, the guy's a fucking pedophile. So fuck him. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, but I, I, I do appreciate, yeah, that we focused on this group. We got a mm -hmm. peek inside the, like behind the curtain and it definitely helps humanize both sides and mm -hmm. establishes that, you know, they're all just kind of people with the same goal, which is just to survive, survive and, and take care of the ones they love. Exactly. At the end of the day, that's all anybody in this world is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I did think it was interesting too, that the cannibalism is a closely guarded secret amongst just the inner circle. Like, the rest of the people are being lied to and told they're eating venison, which is gross. Yeah. It's <laughs> not venison. Up. Venison's pretty yummy. Being told you're eating venison when you're not is gross. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but 
but yeah, I feel like in these kind of survival tales, we get so locked into this idea of like, they're the bad guys. Those other guys across the table, mm-hmm. they're bad guys. And we just fail to think of them as human beings. But this show does such a good job time and time again with the Kansas City arc, with yeah. this arc of establishing that there's this inner group and there's this outsider mm-hmm. group, but both groups are equal in their like, you know, right to survive. Like everyone's just trying to get by. Right. And- the, the you know. show is like the storytelling, a, a peak storytelling example of everyone is the protagonist of their own story, right? And uh, the, as this, as this story goes on, that will become more and more the case. Uh, mm-hmm. Because, like, we very easily could have been watching the Kathleen show and we're rooting for Kathleen to get the guy who, who killed her brother. Mm-hmm. That's a very plausible narrative to tell in this universe, right? Like, is Kathleen a worse person than Joel? Not really. No. No. (laughs) (laughs) I David seems to be a worse person than everybody else, but that's, you know, that's a little different, I would say. (laughs) Yeah. But in in reference to what you said earlier about religion in the apocalypse, I think for a lot of people, they would feel the same way you do. It's like, why would I believe in this at this point? But for a lot of other people, it would be a lightning rod of of hope or mm-hmm. in in or maybe uh, they feel like they are being punished for not being devout enough before. And they've been left behind in some sort of yes. rapture and they're trying to achieve salvation and stuff like that. And there's this movie from a long time ago with uh, it's called The Book of Eli. I don't know if it was good or not. I can't remember. <laughs> but I, yeah, there's a G- Gary Oldman's character in it. He really. He has a cop. He wants a copy of the Bible because the and it's a post apocalyptic story as well. And the reason he wants it, his line was, this isn't a book, it's a weapon. And he's a leader of a community and he recognized like through the rhetoric of Christian faith, he could inspire greater loyalty um, and Mm -hmm. basically create a flock of people. So, yeah, that's interesting. Religion in post apocalyptic fiction is always a very interesting uh, element i think well yeah and i remember when we were watching the walking dead before we fell off the wagon um did that what was his name Ga- Gabriel, Gabriel, gabriel gabriel i think it was gabriel, gabriel. gabriel. Yeah, father yeah. gabriel he, father gabriel he was the priest um who he was a very interesting character and i kind of wish they explored it a little bit more sometimes but it would be like you know it would be him grappling with his own faith and like trying to what figure out like is this like something i still believe in how do mm-hmm. i preach this like to people and how do i get people interested in the cause and like yeah all this other stuff but i thought that was uh, that was an interesting depiction but i will like this in the last of us as well how they mm-hmm. brought it up here yeah um because and- re- religion at the end of the day and this applies to our world as well like it's not good or bad it's just a belief system that has inspired people to do wonderful things and inspired people to do insanely cruel things. Yes. It's not, it's, it's what you do with that doctrine that is important. It's not the doctrine itself. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's so true. Yeah. Like, like Christianity is meant to preach like love and acceptance and all of that. And it's being weaponized by some of the most fucking hateful people that have ever yeah. walked our earth right now. So it's like the, the like you're an express contradiction of your religious doctrine, but you're able to weaponize it for your own needs. When you, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a messed up thing, but um, yeah, one this, thing, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to talk about, uh, or continue with the winter arc here. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my few complaints here is more logistical, again, nitpicky thing. Yeah. By my estimate, Joel, after being stabbed, rested for probably like 72 hours max mm-hmm. yeah something, something like, like that. that just a few days he got stitches he got some medicine um but that wasn't for the full 72 hours it was only for a portion of it so right to, for for me just like and, and i think that they did a good job with it overall um like when he was like initially when the intruder came in and he had to kill him it, they did a very good job with that scene of him kind yeah. of like waking up and getting to the shadows really quickly and mm-hmm. killing the intruder but then he goes on this killing spree, you know, and in my head, I'm like, I don't know. That doesn't 72 hours just isn't enough time. Yeah. To rest, recover, well, there were only like ready there were only three people. And I think he was just. Oh, yeah. Strategic enough to 
get it. I like, yeah, it's a stretch. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm willing to overlook it, especially since this is pulled from a video game. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I'm, in a video game, you heal in two seconds. So you just got to yeah. apply bandages. Like, <laughs> it's whatever. Like, it's cool. Sometimes, here. sometimes you just have to crouch under a little thing, you know, and then your health magically comes back because you're a Call of Duty character. <laughs> that's how, that's how it works, though. <laughs> um, and I, you know, the thing about his killing spree too, um, at the end of this episode is, um, it feels in direct contrast to what happens in the next episode. Okay. Uh, the final, the finale episode, because in in my perspective, Joel, when he goes off and kills like these guys that were hunting him down and mm-hmm. stuff, that that's just really in self defense mainly and in the defense of Ellie. Definitely. Um, in the finale, that is not the case. <laughs> he is murdering people for a more selfish reason, and we can we'll get to that kind we'll of in a that. bit. But yeah, it's like it 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 just felt like a very interesting contrast. Uh, okay. Especially when they're when the episodes are basically back to back, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, but this episode ends not with Joel saving Ellie, but Ellie having to save herself after um mm-hmm. David has captured her, propositioned her to be his wife or concubine or something, even though she's 14. Uh, and um again, pedophile. <laughs> yeah. But uh <laughs> she ends up having to fight her own way out. She sets the building on fire. She gets a meat cleaver and she just fucking destroys this guy. And, but this whole experience brings Ellie to her, her lowest point. She, the cheerful um, pun reading girl from earlier episodes uh, is, is now gone at this point for a little while, Mm -hmm. which leads us into the finale, which first we open with Ashley Johnson, who played Ellie in the video games uh, this time playing Ellie's mother who is pregnant and um, she gives birth or does she give birth before she gets bit or like right after I think she fights the thing off and then the baby's born. I I am not sure. The whole timeline is very confusing to me. Yeah. But but this is our explanation for why Ellie is immune. She was like still connected to her mom via the umbilical cord when her mom got bit. I don't know if I needed that clarification necessarily, but I like Ashley Johnson getting to have a cameo. Um, all all the main players get to show up in this. Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Laura Bailey is a, a cameos as one of the nurses in the finale as well, and she plays Abby in part two, who will be a very important character for the rest of the show. So, um, how neat! Everyone gets yeah. their own little time in the show. Everyone the gets sun. to gets to show up, which is great. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, the main story resumes with Ellie at her lowest point, right? She's she's moping. Joel's trying to cheer her up, but it's not working. And then we get to the famous giraffe scene where they just yes. stumble upon a giraffe. And and I will say, stupid nitpick, but like Ellie sees something and runs off and then runs around like three sets of stairs and outside a building yeah. to something that she would not have been able to see from where she was. But again... I don't care. <laughs> yeah, it's it's whatever. <laughs> it's just when Joel was chasing her, I'm like, how the fuck did she see that giraffe? Yeah, and then at the same time, I'm like, girl, it's an a... you don't right, know what's yeah. in this building. What the hell are you doing yeah. running around? <laughs> I, I do want to talk about that that part um, when Joel calls to Ellie to help with the ladder and she doesn't come because apparently in the in the video game, it's a mechanic that you've used lots of times where. Uh, Joel will boost Ellie up and she'll grab something and throw it down so he can get up. And uh, every time when you like do the button prompt, Ellie comes right away. But in the game, when you get to this moment, uh, you push the button and she doesn't come and you push it again and she doesn't come and you push it again. She doesn't come. And then Joel speaks up and she comes and helps. And that is an example of a a game using the tools of its medium to, uh, tell its story effectively. So just shout out <laughs> to the game for that good stuff. <laughs> That's smart. I like that. Um, yeah, and I and, think the draft scene is so beautiful too. Mm-hmm. Like just the concept of it in general, and like this is a once in a lifetime experience for Ellie too. Like she's never seen this animal in person. She's never mm-hmm. going to see it again. Like it's like right. this is such a profound experience for her uh, yeah. right there, and it's it's very fitting too because it's like giraffes in the middle of the city. This feels out of place, just like two humans in a deserted city, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of walking around. And and it's just a moment of like joy and life enduring, 
I guess, mm-hmm. in this cruel world. Like it's like there's still um moments of beauty to be witnessed, even if the world itself has gone to shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But that and that cheers her up, right? And she's reading puns again, and they're having fun, and then they get uh, ambushed by the fireflies, which leads us to probably the most famous part of this game's story. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically, Joel wakes up in a hospital bed. Marlene is there, and uh, she apologizes for the ambush. I'm like, okay, that, that's polite. Um, and uh, basically says... Ellie's being prepped for surgery and um, she's going to die. They're going to harvest her brain. And they didn't tell her that to spare her. The fear is what she says. And uh, basically says, uh, take Joel outside. And if he like fights back, kill him pretty much. And yeah. Yeah. And then Joel kills everybody. (laughs) So everybody saves Ellie leaves and mm-hmm. oh such oh this killing spree is fucking insane yeah um and i mean the action is great um but i think the concept behind it is um you know obviously the most important part mm-hmm. here because you are faced with this decision and this is the empathy that we're talking about here if you're faced with this decision you either give up your daughter, your surrogate daughter's life, who's been able to fill this void in your life, and you've traveled across the country with her. You've done all this crazy adventuring with her. Right. You you either give up her life and save the world, potentially, too, mm-hmm. or you save her and you kill everybody and you steal that cure from the world. It's it's it, it's such a great like decision yeah. point and and the timing is crucial too we forgot to mention it in the last arc but when uh, Joel and Ellie reunite after the shit with David he calls her baby girl which is what yes. he called Sarah yes. his daughter um i cannot believe we forgot that that's incredibly important because mm-hmm. Joel is being faced with this decision just after the moment where he has fully committed to this girl being his kid basically yes so he is now um yeah we need to talk about the actions of everybody involved in the sequence i think we we need to start with joel yes right off the bat joel is behaving selfishly he Mm -hmm. like i said he's just gotten to this point he thinks of ellie as his kid now and he refuses to lose another child right um and he's willing to place his selfish love of ellie over the fate of everyone and uh Hassan Piker, the Twitch streamer, said this a few weeks ago when talking about, like, is Joel a good person or not, blah, blah, blah. And it's and talking about how the show is about love and empathy and all that. And he says, like, basically, sometimes when you love someone, it feels like even the fate of all mankind takes a backseat to that. And I think that is what Joel's arc here is about. Uh, But in -hmm. making the decision he made, he robs Ellie of any agency in that choice Uh, because he's not. He's not doing this for her. He's not doing oh, this no. with consideration for what she wants. But also, important, to, like, if we're going to examine the ethics of Joel's actions here, we yes. got to look at Marlene a little bit, too, because Joel is not the first person who's robbing Ellie of agency here, is he? Um, oh, no, yeah. Marlene tells Joel and the audience that they didn't tell Ellie what the surgery was. Uh, they didn't tell her she was going to die. They just prep her and they're going to harvest her fucking brain. Like, and, and Marlene is probably right that Ellie would consent to the surgery. Right. But yes, I think so. But you didn't fucking ask. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, there's, I, a, I, there's a lot of a lack of consent here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and... It's very much all the adults in the room making decisions on behalf of Ellie without ever considering what she wants. And mm-hmm. Um, and you know what? Like, if Marlene had decided, I'm going to ask permission of this child to take her brain and then given Ellie the opportunity to say goodbye to Joel, maybe this shit goes down differently, man. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like Marlene, I feel like really dropped the ball <laughs> on her part there. Like, 
yes, it would have been, it definitely would have turned out different if she had just had an adult conversation with the three of them and, you know, gotten down to the brass tacks of it. And then you can act all hostile and, you know, do this stuff. But like, I, even after the episode, like I couldn't, I, I was just like cracking up to myself for a little bit because mm -hmm. Marlene literally pulls a classic Dr. Evil move here. Really? Where she's like, <laughs> well, I'm going to explain this, but okay. I mean, <laughs> She is it just like classic Bond supervillain kind of move, I guess is a better okay. way to put it, where it's just like, I'm going to put two inept guards on this job and I'm going to turn my back away and deal with something else. And oh, I'm just okay. going to assume the problem resolved itself. Yeah. Like, it's literally like what Dr. Evil does. He's like, close the door and I'm just going to assume that Austin Powers died in the other room. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what she does here. She's like, yeah, like take, take the prisoner out on the street and just shoot him. And I'm just going to assume everything went fine. And, but she literally, it's like, she forgot what she said in the first episode of saying like, I know what you two Joel and Tess mm -hmm. are capable of. And she just completely forgot about it and was like, no, my guards have got this. They can escort him off or and kill him if needed. It's like, right. Hey, you could have done that a little okay, bit better. I there. see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, yeah. And, and, and all of this is to say like, Joel did not do the right thing. We understand that what yes. Joel did is wrong, but Joel is, is put in a situation where it's either let this kid who you love die for the possibility that a vaccine or a cure will be manufactured out of it or take the kid you love back to Jackson hole and live a nice life with your, your brother and his new family. That's the position Joel has. And based on what mm -hmm. we know about Joel at this point, we know what he's going to do. And, and also like, Joel has been left with an, probably enough wiggle room in his brain to justify his actions, even if he knows in his heart that it's not what Ellie would want, right? Because, mm -hmm. because like we're saying, Joel is probably thinking, well, she never got a choice. She should, she should be able to like decide if she's alive or not, even though he's saying that to justify his wants, right? But still, <laughs> it's, yeah. it, and it's, um, but I, I think it's important to say, like, none of these people, the, Joel did the wrong thing, right? We're, we're saying yes. that. But I find yeah. the, the conversation around whether he's a good person or a bad person really tiring because I feel like if you're having that argument, you're missing so much about what the show is trying to communicate to you. And because that's not the point. He's a selfish person. But the story is asking you to empathize and put yourself in his shoes. Just like it's doing with every other character throughout the show. Like, people are not black and white. Um, Kathleen isn't evil. She's vengeful. Henry isn't evil. He's protective. Joel isn't evil. He's selfish. Marlene isn't evil. She's utilitarian. She's she's weighing this child's life against the savior of humanity, right? And she's choosing the greater good. Just making that choice yeah. on her own instead of involving the person most affected by it. <laughs> Oh yeah, you're you're so right there because this is kind of I think a turning point too. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole series has been talking about this idea of empathy the whole time, but I think yeah, as uh, when we get to this point where Joel just basically kills the entire Firefly, mm -hmm. um, Freedom Fighter clan thing, um, it kind of leaves us as an audience to question like our our reluctance in this protagonist or our blind faith in them like are mm -hmm. we all in behind them or do we not want to have anything to do with him anymore because yes you're right people are not black and white this isn't there there's no objective evil or good morality is subjective and there's really no ethical or moral ambiguity around his actions here he straight up murders people yeah. but i think the audience uh, definitely starts to question their feelings about Joel here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, this character is definitely compromised now. It's kind of compromised beyond repair. We know that he yes. just kills at will. So I think moving into season two, it's going to, you know, make the audience feel a little uneasy about him mm -hmm. and kind of question, should we root for him? Is this a character that I want to see succeed and, you know, do these uh, other things? Because, you know, we know 
that he's a ter- <laughs> he's a kind of a bad guy. Yeah. And he just kind of explicitly lied to Ellie as well at the end there too. So it's like, okay, right. what's yeah, going on and, here? <laughs> and I want to talk about the the way the ending and Joel's massacre is presented because I'm seeing a lot of again, Twitter is becoming more and more broken and I'm seeing all these tweets from people who I don't follow and don't ever want to see their opinions. So thanks <laughs> for that, Mr. Musk. Um, Thank but you, sir. <laughs> I, all of these these people are now showing up on my feed and they're mad that Joel is being presented as a villain here. And it's like, they're, they think the presentation of Joel's actions is trying to make him look evil. But I felt... The, the slowing down and the music and the way it's all shot, it's not villainous. It's sorrowful, I think. Mm-hmm. He he's, he's like resigned to this because this is who he is and he's going to protect his own. And uh, I didn't feel like the show was telling me to hate Joel for what he's doing. I feel like it was telling me something entirely different. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and it is different than the game because it's it's presented in a different, more subjective or it takes a different subjective approach because in the game, you're doing all of this as Joel, um, which is, mm-hmm. you know, that puts you in a different perspective already. Just, you know, like anyone who plays games understands the the emotional impact that comes from you, the player taking an action. Uh, which is something that I know The Last of Us Part Two plays with a lot <laughs> in its yes. storyline. Um, but yeah. yeah, and another note, it's very so in a our friends who have played this game and every everyone I've heard talk about it when they get to the point where they're at the operating table and they they have to shoot the doctor. Uh, a lot of people sit there for a long time. And like, look for another way to proceed. Oh, really? And oh. yeah. And uh, the game does not let you do that. And it's interesting that in contrast, Joel shows no hesitation or thought to killing that doctor. Yeah. Huh. That is an interesting idea there. Like, I think that definitely speaks to Joel's uh, ter- determination and how he's resigned to this mm-hmm. role as a protector, like you were saying. Um, yeah. Hmm. And um, you know, maybe he he should have thought about that. Just maybe, yeah, maybe <laughs> that, there, there could have been a situation there that maybe it's like okay, let's let, let's figure out a different way around this. But... There there might be be some consequences for that, <laughs> but there might okay. not be. You know, you really don't know. There there nothing could come of it at all. It could you know, I'm sure I'm sure there was no one. Who cared about that doctor? <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely, definitely not. not. No, no, no. Um, no. But uh, we should. But him lying to Ellie. We should talk about that. Yes, because that's him lying to her. That I that's mean, a it, big deal. It creates a unique situation now because mm-hmm. they do have this kind of father daughter dynamic that was established even before um, the fireflies ambushed them. Like. Ellie, I think, said to him, like, where you go, I'll go. Like, she just mm-hmm. trusted him implicitly. Yes. And, and I mean, love and family is this driving value for Joel. And it's like kind of the only thing that is really present in his life. And it's the only thing that he really cares about. Um, and Ellie is that void for him. She's filled that mm-hmm. void. And it just feels like now he'll do anything to maintain that dynamic that they've mm-hmm. established, even if that means killing hundreds of people. Um, so it's just going to be very interesting to see how that changes in season two. But it, the the lying to her is, it's, I I don't I don't know how I feel about that. But I mean, at the same time, I don't like that he lied to her. But it's it's if you can paint over it, uh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? There, about uh, it? it's the perfect ending, I yes. think. Um, and when I saw. I I saw like when I saw that scene, that is what made me understand how amazing this story was. It it was that part because Joel lies and you can see it on Ellie's face, both in the game and the show. She knows he's lying and she just says, "Okay, cut to black. It's so goddamn perfect. (laughs) And I know part two story is amazing, but this is such a perfect ending for a story as well. 
like the like Joel goes to the ends of the earth to to like preserve this girl's life selfishly but in doing so he broke the relationship it will never be the same because she knows he lied Mm -hmm. and she knows she doesn't know what he did but she knows he did something bad and that he's not telling her the truth and yeah. the, re- the relationship is shattered and it's such a powerful scene. <laughs> and I'm, it's... I'm glad they left it unchanged from the game too. That's yeah. That is a great way to end the, end the episode in the uh, season for sure. And one thing that I noticed too, when we were putting together show notes was mm-hmm. the episode title names. And this, I think harkens back to this idea that I was talking about the poetic nature of it. <clears throat> yeah. Some of these cyclical natures too, with, um, you know, his daughter and then his surrogate daughter, these parallels and everything kind of uh, all this stuff going on simultaneously. But the name of the first episode was when you are lost in the darkness and episode nine is look for the light. Mm -hmm. And if we remember from the first episode, it's that quote from the Boston QZ by the fireflies. When you're lost in the darkness, look for the light. And I think that just kind of speaks a little bit further to the connection between Joel and Ellie. She's Mm -hmm. the light he found when he was lost in the darkness um, but yeah, like you said, now the relationship is damaged. Broken. Yeah. And one one more thing. We didn't talk about it in the ethical debate section because it's really not what's important. But with the fireflies and their plan to distribute the vaccine or cure, whichever one it is. Mm-hmm. Um, how? How are yep. you like um, the government in charge considers you a terrorist organization? How are you going to get vaccines and cures to anyone in the QCs? You're not. Um, are how are you going to replicate this thing? Do you have the stuff you need to do that? I don't know. Um, how are you going to effectively perform brain surgery in this dirty ass hospital? I don't know. <laughs> it it does seem yeah. like in it does seem like the fireflies were like, we'll kill the kid and we'll figure everything out later, which I don't know if Ellie is the only person who's immune. You've only got one shot at this. Maybe have an ironclad strategy on what comes next before you kill the only person who has this immunity. I don't know. Maybe try something else before you try the brain harvesting operation. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's kind of like a. It's a big deal. That's like the last thing you can do. (laughs) Mm hmm. Yeah, and then the brain's only good for so long if, unless you mm-hmm. don't have like some kind of freezing thing, which you yeah. probably don't. <laughs> and again, this is a series about empathy and emotions and love. It's not about logistics, which is why we didn't talk about it earlier. But it is like, I don't know, it's worth discussing maybe. But <laughs> It is, yeah. But I mean, it, it's such a fantastic show. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I, even my small complaints, I'm like, yep. I don't, they're not even really complaints. They're no. small errors that maybe they could have tweaked a little bit more, but mm-hmm. overall, yeah, this is the last of us season one, such a fantastic show. Um, definitely going to be one of the top ones for this year. I think like, yep. you know, I, yeah, I don't have any notes on really how they could have done any better. I agree. I'm very interested to see how part two gets adapted. Uh, apparently they are not going to do the entirety of part two in season mm-hmm. two. It's going to be across multiple seasons, which I think the game is longer than part one. So I think that's probably a a wise choice. Structurally, I'm very interested to see the approach they take because Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more going on narratively in terms of structure in that game than there is in part one. So, yeah, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes next. I'm excited for the next batch of characters we get and for the narrative to complicate less excited for the discourse that will happen um, because I saw this discourse once already when the the part two came out and it was really fucking annoying. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Lit the internet on fire. So we'll be looking forward to that. Yeah. But uh, excellent show. So good. Go, go, go watch. 10 out of 10 would rewatch again. Um, Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's transition to the final part of this week's episode where we talk about other stuff we've been up to, what have we been watching, reading, 
doing, playing, mm-hmm. consuming, all that good stuff. So Dylan, why don't you kick us off? What have you been up to lately? I've been I've been fucking busy, man. So <laughs> I uh I wanted to watch all of the best picture nominees before the Oscars came out. So I watched the last few I hadn't seen, which were wow. uh, women, women talking, Elvis and Triangle of Sadness. Uh, all great, very different movies. Um, I actually think all of the best picture nominees this year were pretty, pretty stellar. Um, so, nice. yeah, I, I would recommend watching each of those. I would say I also watched the Oscars on Sunday with some people, filled out the little ballot, and uh, nice. you know, did did all right. I got some predictions in there. Um, all Quiet on the Western Front surprisingly won a lot of awards. Uh, that. Hmm. I, I kind of think some other films deserve some of the ones that won, but that's whatever, you know. Uh, I also watched Batman Returns, uh, which ah, was it, it was extremely my shit. I loved it. I, I like <laughs> it. I like it more than the first one, I think. Um, it's awesome, right? Yeah, it's so cool. And the, the aesthetic of it is what I imagined the first one would be more like. So I could mm-hmm. really see the Tim Burton unleashed in Returns more so than the first one. Um. <laughs> also finished the finale of Poker Face, which was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and continued watching The Mandalorian, which is pretty solid, I think. Um, yeah, I'm liking this season so far. It's off to a good start, I would say. Yeah. Uh, finished Cowboy Bebop, the show. Uh, all I nice. need to do now is watch the movie whenever Amazon decides to deliver my fucking blu-ray <laughs> it's been it's supposed it was supposed to arrive yesterday and now it's by 10 p.m tonight and uh last update it's still in ohio so i don't think i'm getting it tonight <laughs> Let's hey, see. It'll get what, here does it tomorrow. what does it fucking say um <laughs> where, what's the tracking update let's see oh let's how see. fun I, I just love that stuff with amazon yeah. it's still in wilmington ohio where it left wilmington ohio at 12 a.m. <laughs> ah, um, Wilmington. <laughs> but I uh I also, for the first time since I was like five years old, have dipped my toe back into Star Wars Legends, formerly known as the Expanded Universe. I'm reading the first Thrawn book, The Heir to the Empire. Uh, it's pretty solid so far. I'm enjoying it. It definitely reading it, I can kind of understand how someone who read the EU books for decades would not appreciate the sequels sure. because um, this book is, oh man, so many people are going to hate me for this. It's kind of fan fiction-y because that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it It's good. I like it, but it definitely, at least so far, I'm like 70 pages in and it's, yeah. there, there are definitely elements of it where I'm like, Okay, Han and Leia are having like this little quip because they said this to each other once in Empire. And like it's the the first like one of the first places we see oh. in the book is is Tatooine. And one of the first things Luke is doing, it's like he's having a dream about Ben Kenobi, who's like, I have to go die for real now. And um but it it yeah, they're, they're, that, that sounds like fan fiction. Yeah, there are a lot of things that are like kind of like, oh come on, man. But it's but I am overall liking it. And it's interesting because uh it was written in such a different era of Star Wars. Like, I'm pretty sure these came out before well before the prequels, like a long time yeah. before. So when they're on Coruscant, Luke is like looking off of a balcony at these snow capped mountains. And I'm like, <laughs> Well, those don't fucking exist. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fucking lie. <laughs> because Coruscant at this point was like just the fans imagination and they came up with it. And then Lucas changed it when he came back to make more movies. But um, it's interesting. I, I I like elements of it. And I think there are a lot of EU books that take place in between Return of the Jedi and what I'm reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't. I'm not going to read the whole fucking EU, man. I, I it's too much, too much time, but, too much. But I have heard great things about the Thrawn trilogy. So I, um, you know, diving in. I like it. What about you? Cool. What have you been watching? Sorry, I was like 10 minutes of me. Oh, you're chattering. good. You've been watching more stuff than I have. I haven't done too much lately. Um, yeah, started The Mandalorian. I am really enjoying it, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very excited to see where they take take things uh, next, you know, after these first two episodes. Um 
And I said when we were watching the last of us, I was like, I'm gonna make so many Mandalorian jokes while we're filming this <laughs> episode because of Pedro Pascal doing I know, two he's kind shows of, that are basically he's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean they're, got, they're so similar, you know. Stoic guy transports magic child across Yeah, landscape. adopted teen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean, but I'm like the Mandalorian. Um, I also am still working or not working. I'm enjoying Attack on Titan. I got through the entire Trost arc now. Nice. Um, That's a so long arc. It, it... It's long. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it to be that long, but yeah, Aaron's. Um, yeah, spoilers. Yeah, it's just like I'm within the first two episodes of I think I guess it was the second season or whatever where he's starting to join the Scouts. Um, mm which is um, interesting so far. So I'm yeah. excited to see where that I goes I don't remember next. where the seasons break in Attack on Titan because it's like, I think with anime and manga, it's like seasons aren't really that important as much. Yeah. It's more about the arcs. Like it's not, it's not yeah. season based as much, but. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm we wait. Would... I'm waiting for the dub of the first final chapters because I watched the whole show in English and I don't want to switch to Japanese now after. I like, know. <laughs> yeah i i watched it in english too and i don't know i i i just i i would prefer that uh in an anime honestly like that's blasphemous like Squid... for a lot of people niles <laughs> i know yeah it's controversial but i don't know it's it just i think Whatever. i've heard <laughs> i've i've heard like back in the day dubs were all pretty atrocious um and they've gotten a lot oh, okay. better and i i know anime purists are like sub is the way to go and obviously it's the original language the intent of the original creators i think it it depends on the show for a lot of people people recommend you watch cowboy bebop in english but other animes i recommend in japanese i started watching attack on titan when i was pretty stoned and i knew i wouldn't be able to keep up with the subtitles um <laughs> yeah yeah that's <laughs> and now i've got like but it's like you know i've connected with the characters with those voices right and I've yeah. listened. I've listened to bits of uh, the Japanese version, and it's like they sound so different. They basically feel like different people. So I can't switch for the last like two hours of the show. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. I'll be the same way when it gets out. But yeah, um, yeah otherwise we went um, and saw the uh, another edition of the Colorado Opera, another show there. Um, we saw the Dead City uh, or Die Totstad. Uh, it's a German opera. Um, we're so fancy now, going to the opera. No, look at uh, you. <laughs> but I mean, that was a great time. Um, I don't think that we're going to get season tickets next year, but we'll probably switch to like a musical or a play or something okay. instead. But we got one more show this uh, May coming up. Um, Torandant, which is another Torandant. Torandant. And then I, over the weekend, I also uh, watched, uh, continuing my uh, trek with the DC animated movies, um, watched Justice League, the Flashpoint Paradox, um, which was, I was, I was very happy with it, actually. It was really That's cool. That's the first one in the series. <laughs> I know. I'm That's doing this one. all backwards. <laughs> it's so funny that they, that they kickstarted their, like, animated universe with Flashpoint. Like, yeah, because it, it's a thing that resets the universe, like you would think. You want to have our universe to reset first, but no, they just went for it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's bizarre, but I'm I'm into it. It was it was a good it was a good time. So I'll cool. keep tracking with those. Um, yeah, but I, that does it for me. Awesome. Yeah. So that's gonna be our show for this week. Um, and we'll be back. Um, unless something changes, our next episode is gonna be a couple days late. We are gonna be out of town for a thing for a little bit so mm -hmm. uh we are gonna and we we got a uh, early tickets to see dungeons dragons this weekend but we're gonna wait to review it until you guys can see it uh so that's gonna come out friday the 31st i think is the release date of dungeons dragons so you know if you want to wait a couple days to listen to the episode so you can go see the movie that's okay it's <laughs> fine um if you want <laughs> but yeah in uh until then, where can people find you online, Niles? People can follow me on Instagram at Niles Got No Styles. What about you, Dylan? Where can people follow you? On Instagram at Dylan D1026, on Twitter at D Day Movies, on YouTube at D Day Movies, and on Twitter at D Day underscore movies. Or no, wait. On Twitch. <laughs> supposed to be on Twitch. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, and also, you can follow us on TikTok. Play pause. Woo! Rewind underscore podcast, I think is what it's called. 
Uh, and please do, because a lot of our recent ones aren't getting a ton of views. It's making me sad because I work oh. really hard on those. And for some reason, they went from like 200 to 400 views to like 50. So help, please. <laughs> uh, yes, but- thank Thank you yeah. all so much for listening. We do appreciate all our viewers and listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we love making this podcast, so we hope you enjoy listening to it. Yep. All right. Thank you guys so much. We will see you next episode for some Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Yeah. Bye. Bye.